morning. So I saw Luke up here yesterday, and I thought, oh, he has a little tablet. That's a great idea. I'm going to bring my tablet. I don't know if anybody knows what this is. Oh, and I'm not just saying this tablet. This is my work device, and I love it. But this is a Surface, and it's just not as light. <laughs> it's a bit chunky and heavy, so um, I will be obsessing about not dropping this as I go. So Luke gave me an introduction that um, I don't know how to follow up on, but my name is Allison McGuire. I'm an engagement manager for Citrion. Um, you know, as an engagement manager and really as, as an evangelist for social adoption, I'm naturally really passionate about helping you guys, helping our customers achieve their collaboration and social business goals. And at Citrion, we believe that community is really pivotal to achieving that success. Our keynote speaker this morning, Rachel Hoppe, knows a lot about the business of successful communities. Rachel has a background in management consulting, technology product management, and marketing, which really allows her to make connections between behaviors, business processes, and technology. She's principal and co-founder of the Community Roundtable, uh, a first-of-its-kind organization that really marries the power of an association with the strength of a services organization that provides advice, training, and research on the business of community. As publisher of the annual State of Community Management Report, Rachel knows that <clears throat> the rise of the social organization is really transforming the way that we work today. So she's going to talk to us this morning about um, the, a, a vision for the evolving nature of the social organization. So please welcome to the collective stage, Rachel Hoppe. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Wow, that was, um, I, I'm going to bring Allison with me next time. I need to introduce myself because that was better than I usually do um, on my own, uh, even after running uh, the Community Roundtable for five years. Um, but what I'm hoping to do uh, today is give you both a vision of where I think organizations are going as entities, but also one of the things that I get frustrated with a lot uh, is give you some techniques and some um, structures for how, how to evolve versus just become this networked uh, organization. And I, I'm um, really pleased to be here, um, really grateful for the opportunity from Citron. I was um, an analyst uh, in this space. I started IDC's research practice around social software in 2006, 2007. And I actually, I was thinking about it, I remember when I ran across NewsGator for the first time. It was at the Community 2.0 conference in Vegas, which like when I look at, back at it, that was just such an epic conference. It had everybody who knows a lot about communities, even today, uh, were there. Um, but I remember this young woman, and I forget her name, but she came up and she was telling me about RSS feeds and SharePoint, and I was like, why? Hmm. But th that was the moment, and you have come a long way, and actually, one of the things I was most excited to see yesterday was the engagement dashboard because I have been telling vendors for almost a decade now that that's what I'd really like to see because um, scale is not that interesting, but the dynamics in your community really are, and it helps you manage and get to the success you want to see. So let's get started. Um, I'm betting your calendars look something like this. Um, uh, you may be looking at them right now and trying to getting a little bit of a headache about going back to the office. Um, if you've been to a lot of events in this space, you may have been told that you're supposed to be working like this, like starlings in their murmuration, which are organic and fluid and beautiful. Um, I'm betting you think that's about as likely as a unicorn pooping rainbows. Um, but, <laughs> Uh, we do have models for how it works on the open web. So if you look at hashtags on Twitter, we get these very organic communities that our networks spring up around issues and then dissipate as that issue um, goes away. So there are models for how this is starting to evolve. Unfortunately, internally, um, information is used as a weapon. It's used to defend yourself, to intimidate people, to control things. And in that environment, you're never going to be starlings. Um, uh, but 
The, the downside is while you're having an emotionally difficult relationship with your inbox, outside of your organization, whole uh, industries are transforming. And Tiffany's used to be the, the gold standard of the jewelry business because they controlled the entire supply chain and the entire experience of the customer. Now we accepted that because we were getting commoditized luxury. It was the only way most of us could access luxury goods by accepting the fact that it was a commodity. Today, I can go on Shapeways and get custom jewelry to my own specifications, um, and Shapeways isn't even a jewelry business. It is a platform that enables designers to just-in-time manufacture and send their products to customers. This isn't happening just in the consumer business, it's also happening in finance. The way we used to fund innovation and still do is through uh, private equity and venture capital firms. It was these stuffy old men deciding who they were gonna aggregate and fund. But now we have Kickstarter, um, and we have Bo and Yana, which are um, visually programmable robots for children, which is like the coolest thing ever. Now, they would never have gotten funded by a VC firm because they're a very high cost toy. They're not cheap. Um, there's a very niche market for them. But there is a market for them. Um, so no VC would have invested in this because it's never gonna be in Toys R Us. But it is the coolest product out there. Um, and of course, my gadget geek husband who spends too much money on gadgets has to have one for our daughter. So what are these companies doing? They're becoming docs. They're allowing people to dock in, create value, extract value, and then go away at their own choosing. Um, it's, it's a community or a network of people combining to um, establish niche markets. So the technology is here, you all have it. Um, that's not the limiting factor anymore. What's the limiting factor is our work culture. Um, and I think a big part of that work culture is um, most people, and this has been fascinating as I've worked in this space more and more, is that people don't understand e either at a personal level or at an at a organizational level that by giving up a little control and inviting other people in to contribute to your work, you are actually getting way more back in return in terms of value than you ever would if you controlled the whole thing. But people have a very hard time giving up that control. Um, and I've witnessed this in my own life. I, uh, I worked in Silicon Valley about a decade ago in the payment space, and I started a little blog that was completely anonymous because I was too scared to like be out there, and I thought I was sharing kind of stupid stuff because it was just interesting things I tripped upon. Fast forward to when I was an analyst, I started a blog, and that has led to me starting a business. I was not an entrepreneur. I did not seek out starting a business, but what I found is when I put myself out there, I connected deeply with a huge network of people, and that supported, enabled, encouraged me, and opened up opportunities that I didn't even have on my radar, <laughs> like didn't even know were possible. And we can do that internally for staff, too. By helping them put themselves out there, they get opportunities to do work that they're passionate about, that they're connected to. Um, but that's a, that's a unicorn pooping rainbows, um, if you just think about it that way. Um, the problem for all of us is that technology is only going to accelerate, um, and it's causing kind of this perfect storm on the cultural side, which is it's causing so much change that we have in economic insecurity, we have political polarization, we have these huge demographic shifts, and somebody, and I wish I could attribute it last week, I heard this great term, what happens to people is they turtle, or they get cognitive shock, like all this change is going on, what happens to people? They don't do anything, they don't change in any way, they just, want to stop everything from happening, and they want to retrench and go back to what they know, what they're comfortable in, they turtle. And the more you push them, the more they're going to recede into their shell. And so that's a challenge for all of us who want to change organizations, because we can't just keep 
pushing and piling on more change, because the more we do that, the more people uh, experience this cognitive shock and just go back to the way uh, they always did things. Um, as part of that process of turtling, we crave what we know. Um, and what we know is the relationships that we have. And this causes some, some negatives right now in our society in that um, you've got like the vaccination thing where parents aren't vaccinating their children. Why? Because they heard from their friend that their kids could get autism. Well, that's not scientifically proven in any way. And yet we still have this problem. So it's causing this polarization and some weird um, truths to be spread um, because people are connecting uh, with who they know and that's, that's who they're trusting. But if we understand this dynamic, we can use it to our advantage to help create truth through communities. Um, and by establishing truth, we can have a point of view and execute what we want without telling people what to do, which is really the skill of community management, is how do you get people to work towards a common goal without telling them what to do explicitly? Um, and I actually think, I work in the community management field, I think community management is the future of all management because pretty soon all of our communications will be networked communications. So we'll be trying to get people to share our vision and, and provide value towards a point of view, but we won't be able to tell them what to do. Um, so how do we evolve? Um, well, first we need to learn how to build docs. Like we need more doc building skills in our organizations. Um, and while the infrastructure of docs is complicated, the technology, that piece of it, the, the transactional piece of it is complicated enough, that's not the, the piece that's gonna hold us back. Um, it's the people piece, understanding how to give up that control, how to um, pull people in and create value together without um, explicitly telling people how they're gonna do that and giving them that opt-in right to contribute in the ways they feel most compelled to. So to me, communities applied in small areas to our business are helping us understand this culture of doc building. Um, and ultimately, um, what they do, communities kind of do two things. And the, the first thing is the most obvious one. We see Twitter, we see Facebook. I can now share content with thousands millions, whatever, of people. But I, I think that's only the marginal benefit for communities. Um, that's a very content network-based view. Um, more importantly, they enable this shared ownership and commitment, meaning if I invite you in, if I don't complete the sentence and allow you to, you own half of the sentence now. Um, you are bought into that, and now we have two advocates for that point of view, or more, depending on how many people you invite in. Um, and I think, People and organizations get this wrong all the time. They go after the first, and it's the second that's gonna have the transformative effect. And what that looks like from a network structure is this, which is if you're doing the first thing, that's great, you get marginal value, sharing online allows a much cheaper way of sharing with lots of people, but it doesn't scale because you're still at the center of that network. And so you have to keep building content. You have to keep sharing. You have to participate in all the conversations. And so um, we have, I know one media company, they just keep adding community managers because they keep having more and more conversations online. Well, that's, that's just not scalable. That's replacing your customer support ticket system with an online conversation system. It's still transactional. If you do the following and you're starting to enable relationships between people, you're starting to educate people so they can be advocates on your behalf, they can contribute to value, you're really scaling your ability to have more and more conversations. Um, and you may not even know what most of those conversations are, but you look at my organization, we started with two people and we were able to spread the word of what we were doing worldwide because we really invited people in and asked them to contribute to what we were doing and built value together. That's how we do the research we do. We ask our members to come in and tell us what they need to QA how we ask those questions 
So we're giving them data that's truly impactful for what they're doing. Um, and then they're advocates because that's data that they, they wanted. The other thing, and this is, this is kind of some of the time my frustration with the, the cultural conversation is it's so big and it's so vague um, that how do we attack the problem? And I actually think communities play a role here too. And um, I had my own aha moment with the, when I read The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg, who kind of consolidated a lot of the social science research that's been done over the years. And he said, if you want to sustainably change a habit, you need three things. And the first thing you need is the mechanics of the habit change. What are you going to do instead of something else? And there's a whole behavior flow kind of trigger behavior reward thing to look at at that point. That's typically where our organizations stop. They're like, you should do this instead of that. OK, somebody can, but why should they? They're already habitua, habituated um, to spend their time in email. The second um, thing is people need belief that the change is worth doing um, and that it's, it's, it's um, a good change. So that's really important, and we don't really address that. That's evangelism. How do, you, how do you measure that in organizations? How do you measure belief? But it's really, really important. And then the third thing, and this was my big aha moment, was communities are really important to uh, sustain habit changes. Because if you don't have a community of the changed, um, when people are under stress, they will revert to the old behavior, and they will kind of fall off the change loop. And so you need people who will come in and say, no, you're on the right path, keep it up, um, call me, I'll hold your hand through this, it's going to be okay, you're doing the right thing. Um, and this actually even changed how I thought about our business, because we do a lot of professional development, we do a lot of kind of scaled coaching, and I was like, but you know, the real value of our network is we have a lot of people who are unicorns, who their organization don't understand what they're trying to do, um, and it's a really tough job. You're rolling boulders up a hill, and you get midway up the hill, and you feel like the boulder's going to crush you. Um, well, that's when you go to a community of people who are doing it and say, no, you're actually being really successful. I feel like half my job some of the time is just hearing somebody and be like, oh my god, you got your CEO to look at your internal platform? That's huge. And when you're in the moment, you look at that and say, I didn't get very far. I spent six months doing it. That didn't seem like a good ROI for my time. And yet it is. And so having other people there to acknowledge that you are making progress and you are being successful and you are on the right path is huge, whatever that behavior change is. Um, and our research this year, um, and thank you for uh, sponsoring Citrion, they were a great supporter and allowed us to put this out in the market, um, really aligned with this in three ways, which is community management processes um, do deliver real business value, and we were able to substantiate that if you invest in community management processes, you will be much more likely to be able to measure value on the back end. And uh, the research report is full of all the different ways you can invest in uh, community management processes. But that's the mechanics of the change. If you do this, you will get value. OK. Um, the second one, we found executive participation and engagement impacts success and engagement of the whole system. It's not enough that executives sponsor things. They really have to be involved. Why? Because people are not going to believe that this is worth doing until the executives do it. Um, that's really what it comes down to. And they really need to model this behavior in, so that the rest of the organization takes it seriously and also starts uh, that behavior flow. And then lastly, advocacy programs increase engagement and are correlated to ability to measure value. And what this means is finding advocacy groups and really spending time uh, trying to gel them within your organization is important because those are the people who believe the change is good, have changed, and need to support each other um, so that they maintain uh, that change. So that was really exciting. Um, and when I talk to executives, 
Um, a lot of people don't understand the, the investment benefit curve of communities. Um, and this is kind of a big problem because we don't invest in community management processes um, because we don't, we're not seeing payoff right away. But the issue is that community growth is ge a geometric curve, not a linear curve. So if you're trying to measure at three months whether you've got an ROI, you're probably not going to be anywhere close to that. Um, so we've kind of put kind of forward this way of thinking about measuring and tracking performance and what you're really looking for along the way. In the first phase, if you're introducing new behavior to the organization, it's really hard to get the first person or the first five people to exhibit that behavior change. And the first thing you need to do is change your behavior yourself. And then you have to go to one person and change their behavior and figure out how that works and whether it's good for them. And behavior change really starts with one person. You cannot change 10,000 people all at once, like it, especially if it's new behavior. Once that behavior change happens, what then happens is you get pull. All those people who are doing work in a new way and have become advocates for that, they pull other people in there. And they say, hey, Larry, I never have a status meeting anymore on my team. And Larry goes, really? I hate status meetings. They take up half of my Mondays. I used to have executive management meetings that took three hours every Monday morning. Like, shoot me now. Like, that's not a good use of my time. Um, so they're going to help advocate and pull people into that behavior change. <clears throat> And then once that behavior change is normalized on a decent segment of the population, you can add new members and there's normalized behavior and it's much easier and much more cost effective with each additional person. And now that it's normalized, you can transform that process that you're working on and get rid of the old uh, way of doing something. I like to think of this as an, a Mad Libs approach uh, to strategy, which is, um, if you are going after an ROI, really distill that down into this very specific behavior change that will get you to that ROI. And which processes are you looking for? Is it an information seeking behavior that you want to change? Is it a collaboration behavior that you want to change? Work synchronization? Any of those things. And I'll give you some examples. So. Um, when a member wants to get updates from an entire team, they're going to use the community to collect those status updates instead of having a team meeting. Another example of this is when a member or employee wants to make a purchasing decision, they will use the community to share the proposal and get feedback instead of sending it out to 200 people on a distribution list, 75% of which don't care. Um, so really, be very specific about this. Um, and my advice is focus on one opportunity for each community use case that you're going after. One thing that I uh, see happening is communities generate a lot of different values in a lot of different areas that cross different parts of the business. Um, but if you don't have a clear focus to start, it's really hard to measure value and you get very kind of in the weeds about what I should be looking for and what behavior is interesting versus not interesting. And you start trying to aggregate all this data because now you can measure everything. And so you're looking at all this behavior data, trying to make sense of it instead of having a very clear idea of the behavior you're trying to go after, how you're going to measure it, benchmarking before you introduce the new behavior and benchmarking after so that you know where you're making progress. Um, the other thing, and I think this happens with internal communities a lot, is we forget to define a shared purpose. Um, we know what the business is going to get out of this behavior change, but we don't really think about articulating what the employee is going to get out of the behavior change. And unless the, behavior, unless the employee is going to get benefit out of it, they're not going to do it. They're just not. And so um, you can have all the communities you want that are going to kind of transform the business. But if you can't figure out how to give the employee value and show them what that value is and make that appealing, um, it's going to be a non-starter. Um, the other thing that's really important is understanding your target employee or member of the community. Because different uh, employees have different um, 
engagement profiles, whether they're more or less likely to engage, and it matters how much they need to learn, um, how comfortable they are with online technology, how isolated they are, there's all sorts of factors. And depending on those factors, you may need more or less community management. I like to always use the baby center example. They don't need community management. There's a bunch of mothers at home with new babies that are very complicated, they don't know what to do. They're gonna go find each other, because that's their, they have a very high need to learn, they're very isolated. Um, and there's enough of them that are comfortable with technology. So that, that use case needs very little um, community management. Executives are kind of on the other end of the spectrum. We're really busy, um, don't know they have a need to learn, like have a lot of inputs already, so um, don't feel like they're missing anything. Um, they're much harder to kind of get collaborating in, a, in an environment. Um, uh, Chei Chen Liu at BASF, who's one of our clients, define these four different areas of community use cases that are, are pretty dominant in terms of the types of communities we see internally. Um, it's the community of practice. I'm gonna get all my UX engineers together in a community, and uh, a lot of that is complex questions being answered and looking for expertise um, and experience. Uh, there's the collaboration communities. Those are, we're actually getting work done uh, there's personal networks, so interest-based networks, um, and then organizational initiatives, so whether that's diversity or, or uh, kind of um, environmental or what have you. And each of these communities have very different dynamics. Um, and I have this chart um, that kind of displays some of the, the different characteristics, which is depending on what you're hoping to get out of the community, um, you're gonna want a different size of community you're gonna want a different density of relationships. Meaning, if you're in corporate communications and you're sharing information about environmental initiatives, you're really trying to inform uh, people and maybe solicit a little input. You're gonna want a much broader community of all your employees than somebody who's negotiating a new partner deal um, and there's some complex negotiation happening. That's gonna be a small community. It's most likely gonna be private as a lot of that negotiation and compromise happens. So figuring out what you want and figuring out what the right community structure to achieve that is important. Um, and lastly, helping people understand where communities fit in their workflow. We used to only have the phone and in person, and then we added email, and people could still kind of keep up because that was three major channels. Now we have IM and email and community and uh, 500 different communities and Twitter and Facebook. What channel is best to use for which part of the process? And just generally, like when I, when I don't know what I don't know, I'll use my research process, where do I go? I go to my biggest network, which is Twitter, and say, what do people know about whatever I'm thinking about? And I get exposed to all sorts of stuff. And then I spend time myself consolidating that, because it's very hard to ask a whole group of people to consolidate something. Um, they don't know what you're thinking. But then I go to the analysis phase, and I go to a community of practice. Conveniently, I have a bunch of people in my community who do what I do, and I say, here's my hypothesis on this. Does that sound right to you? Is it worth exploring? Is it valuable? Like, would the results of this be interesting? And they say, no, or if you adjusted it this way, or I'd really like to answer this question. Um, that's really great feedback, but if I asked Twitter, I'd get so much crap back, because they have no idea they don't share my context. So it's not good at that point in the workflow. When I'm building the report, that's gonna be a very small team of people collaborating in a wiki type document um, setting. Probably two, three, four people, no more than that because it gets hairy. Um, but then I go back out to stakeholder review. This could be a community of executives, it could be a community of practice. And I say, is what I am delivering in draft format, does it answer the questions that we were hoping to answer in the hypothesis stage? Um, does it give you what you need? Is it valuable to you? And then I launch or publish it to the broader network, and oh, by the way, because I've included all of these people, I now have like 200 advocates who know what I was working on, who feel bought in because they've contributed, and hopefully I've done my job and thanked them in the end and included them in that. But 
really getting to the nitty gritty of the workflow and helping people understand where it's valuable to reach out to these networks is just really important because people don't, can't vis tangibly visualize what they don't know. Um, so we found some things in our research this year um, that are highly correlated with value. Um, so the first is executive engagement, the second is advocacy programs, the third is having commun dedicated community managers, um, responsive integrated platforms, um, enabling policies and playbooks, meaning don't just r have restrictive policies that say you can't do this, you can't do that, especially internally, people do know they can get fired and they're actually much, it's much harder to get them to engage. You have to tell them what you're looking for, what's okay, what's not gonna get them into trouble um, because they are already are hesitant. They, they know that they're being kind of looked at, exposed, et cetera. Um, and then outcome-based measurement. Again, this was why I was so excited about the engagement uh, dashboard because it's the first kind of outcome-based dashboard I've seen for community managers versus kind of a more web analytics-based dashboard of like, I've had 10,000 hits on this page, but did anybody do anything? Did they fill in their profile? That's what I need to know. Um, so lastly, I just wanna say it's really important to start with the end in mind because if you're not thinking holistically or about where this gets you in the end from a business structure and strategy perspective, um, you may make, I, I don't wanna say the wrong choice, but you won't enable as much as you have the potential to enable if you don't kind of see where this is all going. So understanding that you're building docs, that you're not just solving a business problem for today, but you're trying to create and establish a culture of collaboration within your organization where people take responsibility and ownership for their own work and they help each other. Um, by doing this, what I think is going to happen for most of our large organizations, how they're gonna evolve, is they're gonna create all these little communities in their internally in core operations. They're gonna establish all of these communities that hit their partners and customers in different ways. And those are gonna start merging together. Um, and they're gonna create their ecosystem that way. Um, and at the end of this all, um, I think roles are gonna change significantly and what it means to be an employee will change. Um, I'm seeing this already in our really successful communities. Um, our customers are being brought into development jams. So are they customers or are they employees? Because they're helping code new product. So what is that? Um, we have tons of contractors working in our organizations already today because we need their expertise some of the time, not all of the time. So I think we're gonna become these platforms where the mission of the CMO is really to establish shared purpose and stakeholder experience. So people are bound together by a purpose and a passion um, and they come together to build value together. Um, the CTOs, will own subject matter expertise, and they will be the ones who, in the open source world, check in and check out code, meaning they will curate and define what is um, valuable to the shared purpose of the ecosystem. HR then becomes policy and governance. They, they in effect, set the exchange rate for work and say, if you contribute this, we'll give you this in return. Sometimes that might be an employee contract, sometimes that might be free product. Value is not always going to be financial. Um, and then the CIO will be responsible for the infrastructure for making this all happen. So that's my vision of where we're going as organizations and hopefully I've been able to give you um, some real specifics about how I think we can help our organizations get from where we are today uh, to where we're going tomorrow and it's not I don't think uh, the boil the ocean strategy uh, is gonna work. That's just not how we transform. We have to take it one person, one community at a time. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. I'm looking forward to hearing some case studies. So you mentioned that our work cultures are not keeping up with the pace of technology. Mm -hmm. um, how can communities actually help us with that cultural shift? 
so one of the things I mentioned in the presentation is like we, we retract and turtle and we go back to what we know and what we've always known is relationships. That's something that's been a constant for us and it's one of the things that won't change. Um, and I look at, um, a couple years ago, I was looking at the corporate balance sheet and I was like, where are the humans on the asset side of this? Turns out they're not on the asset side of the balance sheet. We don't value them as assets from a accounting perspective. And yet we're still valuing um, technology, but it amortizes so quickly now, it's commoditizing. Um, and so what's flipped is that humans are the most expensive things we have in our organizations. We can outsource our supply chain, like technology is cheap. Um, and so that relationship thing is where I explore. Um, and I think giving people that touchstone allows them to have emotional safety and opens them up and allows you to introduce new ideas if they feel emotionally connected and safe. Versus, here, take some information, learn something. Like, which is sometimes how, how I feel like Twitter is. Like, right. I, I'm like, if Twitter was in real life, people would be like parading by my desk, just like dropping crap on my desk. <laughs> and I'd be like, like, I'd be buried and be like, just stop. So yeah. that, that touchstone is really important. And so when you're thinking about evangelizing, especially with executives, um, step back and like connect with them and ask them about themselves and what they care about. And like really, like that's, that's what's going to, to enable somebody to change. Yeah. And I think uh, that's a, a great example. It makes me think of the, when you, when you first start to, to engage in, in um, in a social platform, a lot of times what people will do is kind of do what you just did and just just blast out something like, I read this article, here's a link. And so how do you respond to that? You what? would never walk up to somebody in a, in be a, like, Here. In a, and go, read this. I read this article. And you would engage in conversation, <laughs> you wouldn't ask a question. Well, and we're seeing <laughs> that translated to there's some common practices, standardizing practices in community management. One of them is well, having a welcome process. Like, don't just add people to a community, post a lot of content, and hope for the best. Right. Like, reach out to them and be like, hi, Allison, what are you doing here? How can I help? Like, what's your interest in this topic? Yep. Here's how you can use this community. And they're like, oh, okay, excellent. They're much more likely to engage, and if they engage the first week, they're much more likely to engage over time, so. And if you're looking for a model, we actually do have this, an exact community like this modeled on Engage. Um, so where we welcome in new people as they join the Engage community. Um, so uh, when we look at like successful collaborative economy startups like Airbnb and you, you get the example of Kickstarter, um, they're really placing communities at the core of their mm -hmm. businesses. Um, what, is this, what does this tell us? The thing that excites me the most about those collaborative economy startups is they are translating the community model into their business model, which I um, see as a big gap in most people's thinking around how can I build products that really uh, rely on the community um, and use the community to generate marketing, sales, support, like, and, and that ultimately is where we wanna get with our large organization. So, I mean, most of you probably know Jeremiah Aoyang, he's started the um, crowd companies. So he's really looking at that kind of strategic view. But to me, it's the marrying of the engagement model, the networked engagement model with the networked business model. And one of my big critiques of Facebook is that it's, it, it's going to torpedo itself because it created a revolutionary engagement model and slapped an old school media model on top of it. And so it's becoming more and more of a media property. Surprise, surprise. So um, that's where I find looking at those companies is really helpful to, GiftGaff is another one that's been around for a while. If you don't know, it's a telecommunications company in Scotland, I think. Um, 
So communities achieve value as they mature, and, and we know that there's a really significant investment that you need to put in up front of time and resources before you get to that value demonstration. And do you see organizations actually investing in what it takes to make enterprise communities successful? So in the data for this year's research, it was really interesting, and we didn't report on it because it wasn't consistent enough, but I saw this trend of like communities that were 10 years old or so had mature processes, but then communities that were five, four, five, six years old were less mature. But then communities that are one and two years old actually were more mature than those that were three, four, five years old. And my hypothesis of that, looking at our customer base and all the communities I interact with, is that old communities have learned their way into maturity. Uh, communities that are three, four, and five are learning their way to maturity but haven't gotten there yet. But newer communities have leveraged what we know now. And so it's, it's a complicated answer, yes and no. Um, I see communities all the time who are just starting, who are doing, uh, last week, Sage, uh, uh, a big accounting company, has done a really phenomenal job with community launch because they really listen to those who have gone before them. And we have so many case studies now uh, that we can point to but then others aren't reaching out, they're not learning from their peers, they're not taking advantage of stuff, and we actually saw a very, uh, a correlation between uh, use of external consultants and research and ability to measure value. So one of my messages is, and I'm biased because I do this, but reach out to your peers, like spend some money understanding what everybody else is doing, because we know, I think Unisys yesterday, like, it's no longer a mystery how they got to 90% adoption. We know what the techniques are, so leverage those. Absolutely. So I think, I think we'd like to open up questions to the audience. And we have a roving mic over here that um, looks like Marcus has. So do you have any questions from the audience for Rachel? Good morning. Uh, this Good is morning. Jerry from MasterCard. One, one thing that you touched on a little bit was uh, the ROI. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see the ROI when you're talking about this type of uh, environment to be much more, um, <coughs> I, I'll put it soft cost, or is there anything that's real true hard cost that you can build into that ROI? It's sometimes challenging, but not most of the time challenging to get to the ROI. And you may not get specific models, but I think Mary uh, yesterday had a way of working out how much cost savings the Q&A uh, tool was saving at Medtronic. So you may not have like specific data, but you can build models that um, do a rough uh, hypothesis of cost savings. But you can't do that if you don't benchmark the behavior before and after. For example, like one of the things that I think is a super easy first step for internal is take distribution lists and post them to blogs. Get them out of email. What that does is it saves IT resources because there's not an IT resource just taking people and putting them on distribution lists, which like, is not value added time really. Um, it saves people time in deleting emails that they're getting from distribution lists that they don't care about. It allows them to opt in, opt out, consolidate all the comments on a blog. You can start tracking that, meaning you can take a survey of people and say, how, what percentage of your emails are distribution lists today? Like it's a simple question, survey 25 people and they'll say like 30% of my emails are distribution lists. You make the change, you survey them again and they say it's down to 10%. You're not gonna get rid of all the distribution lists, some are secure, but like you can get rid of a lot of them. So um, things like that, and then you know your average fully burdened headcount for your employee, you can get that from HR, you marry the two, how much cost savings have I gotten? Um, it, there's, there's usually ways to find that measurement um, closely enough that it will, will give you a number um, that you can take to executives. But, but you can't get there if you don't really look at that behavior flow and what the before and after uh, is going to save on a per person basis and then extrapolating that out to 
the whole employee base. But I'm happy to chat about specifics if you'd like. Okay, any other questions? I think we do have a little bit of time. Not that interesting, huh? <laughs> We've got one at the back. Hi, um, when you said not to boil the ocean, that really kind of struck a chord with me. When you have a small team and you're really trying to grow adoption and usage, you mentioned, you know, focus on maybe one community at a time or how would you sort of work to prioritize mm. what you should focus on or what your biggest hits would be? I would look at your strategic priorities at a very high level for the organization and then I would look and audit your communities and say which of these communities or processes impact the things that the executives are really focused on this year because they're the ones that they're looking for how to make progress on um, and uh, kind of I do a forced rank waiting some of the time where I take the corporate priorities, I put all the initiatives down the left, I wait the priorities, like it's not that comp, like, but that's where I would start is things that will get the attention of the people that have the power to influence, um, giving you a bigger team, for example. So if they see success on some of their core priorities, um, and they come to you and say, why aren't we doing this across the organization? You say, well, I've got a staff of three people, so <laughs> we chose this impact first and we'll move on, but if you'll give me more people, we can do this faster. No other questions? Great, well, Rachel, I have Excellent. a lovely gift for you. I can uh, gamify nice. myself. <laughs> Absolutely. It's one of my favorite activities. Are you motivated by stuff like that? Um, well, I, we were chatting and I started running my 40th birthday because I was like, it doesn't get better from here. Like, I, if I don't start exercising now, it's not gonna get any better. I love that because I did the same thing. Um, uh, and, and because I work in this space, I was like, I really need to figure out how to make a complex behavior change for myself if I'm recommending other people do this because it starts with you. Like if you can't do it, you're not gonna get anybody else to do it. Um, so yeah, I, um, I, I, I got up to running a 10K. I registered for a race last October um, and broke my ankle two weeks before the race. Oh, yeah. um, so I'm now back up to four miles and I'm working my way back up to 10K. Excellent. So this well, will help. I hope help. you enjoy it. Thank you. Invite to our Thank you. Thanks.